If you have your Bibles with you this morning, we would ask you to turn to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, and while you're turning there, I always covet your prayers as your pastor and stand in need of them. Isaiah 55, and we're going to begin reading in the first verse. Isaiah 55, in the first verse, the Bible says, Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye and buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfieth not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. And climb your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul will, shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commander to the people. Behold, they shall call a nation that knowest, behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run into thee because of the Lord thy God, and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you. Lord, we pray this morning that you would bless your word. Lord, for the lost that are here, Lord, that you might save them, that you might see them high and lifted up as Isaiah did, Lord, that you would, they would see you for who you are. God, we pray this morning that you would extend grace to the lost and those of us that are saved, Lord, that you'd break our hearts up and make them fallow ground to what you'd have us to do. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all, for it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, somewhat familiar passage, uh, familiar passage from Isaiah. And um, Isaiah was one of those preachers, pretty much, he either preached on the coming destruction of Israel and the relief. That's one. That's the two essential themes of, of his book is that destruction is coming, but there is a way to escape. And this morning, I'm telling you, destruction's coming, but there's a way to escape. Amen. Uh, there, there, there is a man that lived and died a sinless life and poured out his life blood for his people, and he is, uh, he is the way of escape. I think I was hearing Brother Jody uh, talk about the new chips that they want to put into us, and it has your credit card information and your health information and, and uh, all that in one little piece. Uh, listen, dear friend, uh, that gives me uh, an uncomfortableness because it is the mark of the beast. And I don't think it's graduated to that level, but the technology exists. And all our government has to say is you can't buy or sell without it. And it's coming. That's right. But you know what? Uh, there's a Savior on the throne even in this difficult time. Even in the time which we live, uh, the Lord is still saving people. There's a little boy over at uh, uh, Clarksville Baptist Church, uh, Faith Baptist Church of Clarksville. The Lord saved him. Uh, 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 in the last meeting they had, the Lord is still saving people. It's not outside His ability. It's not outside uh, of the ministry that He still has. And so we see that in this chapter, uh, Isaiah put, points others to Christ. Uh, one verse talks about the King of David, and, and then the next verse allu alludes to Christ. The only answer to sin that I have for you this morning is Christ. That's right. uh, uh, we are born into sin. We, we have nothing good, no value, no goodness about us, whatever, but I can point you to Christ. So in the first verse, the prophet Isaiah says, Ho, 
Now, that's not used very much anymore, but it's a way to get attention. Uh, a very comfortable word in the modern day be, hey, ho, oh, listen, stop a minute. You need to hear what I have to say. Ho, oh, stop. And you know what? We need to hear more of that in the modern day. A little interruption in this routine that constantly keeps us spinning and going with seemingly, seemingly no stopping to what we have to do. Stop a minute. Ho, oh, listen. Because uh, the Savior uh, still saves. And, and so we see that's what he does to get the attention of the nation of Israel. Everyone that thirsteth Come ye to the waters. Uh, everybody, and if you look at that carnally, everybody say, well, everybody thirst. Well, I first say carnally, that's not true. Uh, the closer you get to death, liquid means nothing to you. You can encourage, I mean, you literally can put it to their lips and they will not accept it. So no, not everybody thirsts. And, and on top of that, certainly uh, people don't thirst for the Word of God. Uh, we live in a day and age today where that's almost uh, not existent. The only people that are thirsty for the Word of God are those that He has redeemed unto Himself. So as the prophet begins to uh, uh, seemingly give a general invitation, it's not for those that thirsteth after God. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and ye that have no money. Very, very clear, you cannot buy your redemption. You cannot buy your salvation. Come as you are. Come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come by wine and milk without money and without price. The price of redemption has been paid through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. There, there's nothing else left for us to do. He saves us. Verse 2, wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? Now that's a very, uh, <clears throat> a very uh, unusual verse. And you think about all the time and the energy that you put into stuff that really has no value at all. You know, it used to kind of upset me, you know, uh, people in these huge big houses and, you know, brick homes and two-story. You know what? If my little double wide makes it another 30, another 30 years, I'll be done with it anyway. Right? So what's the point? Yeah, you know, th there is no point. Why, why are we wasting that time? And, and this is it. We brought into the, wor the world's agenda. Do you have to have somewhere to sleep? Do you have to have uh, somewhere to live? Most certainly. But it don't have to be the best. And it, it, it's not going to last anyway. And so we find, as the prophet as Isaiah is writing, he says, what, uh, what are you doing with your time? Where are you spending your energy? What are you putting your emphasis upon? And, and he asked them that question. Uh, why are you spending this time for something that's not going to help? Where do you spend money for that which is not bread? And your labor for that which satisfieth not. Now, uh, of a surety, this flesh will never be satisfied. If you make a million dollars, and I, I'm not going to say it is because I don't like to throw away around names when I'm preaching, but there's a man here in this county and he became a millionaire and uh, just worked and worked and worked all his life. And I knew this man's niece very well. And me and this girl was talking one day and she says, you know what? When uncle so-and-so became a millionaire, all he wanted was more. Mm -hmm. So th this, this flesh is insatiable. Uh, it, you, you'll never be able to fill it up. And, and so, what then, it, well, he asked a question that deserves answer. Why do we do that? Well, it's one of two things. Number one, you're lost, either you're lost or you're focusing on the flesh. 
If we focus on the flesh, we're not going to be satisfied. And, and, and most certainly, if we're lost, we're never going to be satisfied. And, and so you fit into one category if you have this appetite that you cannot fulfill. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good. This is the best meal you will ever eat. This is the thing that will satisfy way past the, the meal we're about to receive downstairs for the graduates. This is much, much more uh, meat, much more fulfilling than anything that we can take in. But the majority of the time, we don't we don't do it. Uh, well, Monk's Mill Church, where I went through, I went to for ten, over ten years. And there was a woman there, and me and Jared was laughing about this, but this is a true statement. Her Bible laid on the dashboard of her car so long, it was faded. And all she would do was get in the car on the Lord's Day, grab the Bible, go into the Lord's house, come back, throw it back up on the uh, dashboard, and that would be it. <clears throat> What kind of example do you think that she was leaving for her children? You see what I'm saying? Uh, we need to begin to treat this word uh, uh, as the jewel that it really is, as the precious price, the, the, the very thing that gives us life and nourishment. And that's what this is. And then he describes the diet that this book will provide. Hearken diligent, diligently unto me, eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Now, the cardiologist would not agree with you on this, but what the Word of God is telling you, the rich part of the world, I mean the rich part of the Word, now, remember what he uh, wrote to Corinth in that first scathing letter? He says, you're still on milk when you ought to be on meat. Well, th this is exactly what he was making reference to. You know, a lot of churches today, if you preach them, some of the messages that I preach here, they choke on it like a baby choking on steak. Mm -hmm. And you know why? It's not because they've not gone to church long. It's because they've not been nurtured. They, they, they've not been fed. And, and so we find that as Isaiah is writing this to the nation of Israel, uh, he said, enjoy what you have. Verse 3, incline or listen, incline your ear and come unto me, hear and your soul shall live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Now, hear this morning. Two things you need to hear. Have you ever been saved? And will you trust the Savior? That's the two things you need to con contemplate this morning. Uh, verse 4, Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader. Now he begins to kind of, and this happens again and again in the Word of God, uh, kind of bringing Christ and using David as an example to explain who he was and what Christ's ministry was about. He wanted them, even in the Old Testament, to see Christ. You know when someone will be saved? When they see themselves as a wicked sinner and they see the Lord Jesus Christ as the answer. That, that's when they're saved. Uh, it don't happen by some little pity pat, uh, repeat this prayer. God's not a thousand miles of that thing. But I want you to see that he does reveal himself for who he is. Behold, I have given him, meaning Christ, and also David, uh, for a witness to the people, a leader, and a commander to the people. Now, what is a witness? If you uh, were testifying as a witness, what does that mean? It means you've seen it, right? There's car wreck. Uh, there's one of the employees over at the nursing home Yesterday, she was late, and she got there, and she saw a car wreck. And she said, I had to be a witness. Tell, tell which one made the error. Uh, I needed to be a witness. Well, you know, we live in a day and age when there's not a lot of witnesses left. If they're saved, they don't say anything about it. I need a witness. Uh, and, and we all do. And so we see that David... Uh, 
David had this, this ministry. Behold, I've given the people for a wit, I've given him, uh, behold, I've given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that knowest not me, and nations that knew not thee shall run to thee because of the Lord thy God. Now here in verse 5, we have a, a, a very definite description, prophecy of the Gentile believers, me and you. Uh, uh, I, I will be a witness to them. Uh, you know, a lot of people say, well, it was when, uh, when Paul was sent to the Gentiles. Well, that, that was his ministry. But Jesus came to claim the Gentiles. That, that was his ministry. That's why he came. Uh, that's one reason so few Jews are saved is because the ministry of Christ is to the Gentiles. And, and, and so we see that uh, he remind, Isaiah brings their attention to that. That we will come through him. Verse 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Now, what the word while suggests time. You know, you may think I've been preaching a while this morning. Uh, that's a certain amount of time, right? And then uh, you get into a long while. Well, don't, don't fret. I went to a meeting the other night. They had three speakers. You're going to be fine. Uh, and so we see that he says it's, it's a period of time. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Now, from the direct understanding of that, if there's a timepiece and you seek him while he can be found, what's the end result? There has to be coming a day when he can't be found. And it is. It's coming. Uh, uh, the, day, the day of the rapture is very, very near. I see it more and more as I'm following this technology and these implants that people are wanting to do. It's upon us. We have, we, are you ready? Has the Lord saved your soul? Do you ever see him high and lifted up? The, the very same prophet here in Isaiah chapter 6, he said, I was in the Lord's. I was in, in the house of the Lord and I saw, Je I saw him high and lifted up. You know what? Before that, Isaiah had never said that before. I personally believe Isaiah wasn't saved until Isaiah 6. And the Lord saved him. And, and so we see that we as the Lord's people and you that are lost, look very closely at yourself this morning. Then he gives this advice, call ye upon him while he is near. Verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way. Now we live in a very unusual day and I posted something on Facebook, and the, you, those of you that are friends with me, I'm sure saw it, uh, about, you know, it was something like, you know, little boys and little girls are too young to figure out a gender. Let them, be, you know, let, just let them play. Just let them be kids. And my cousin, and I won't say which one, me and her butt heads all the time. We're distant cousins. Mm -hmm. Praise be to God. And, uh, She's always writing me about my opinions. And she goes, yeah, let them decide later. And of course, that was just a gouge at them, a gouge at me. But isn't it a strange day that we live? That, that that's a choice? Isn't that foolish? Isn't that stupid? I mean, it don't take a rocket scientist to figure out your gender. And, and so we see, as he is writing to them, his suggestion to these wicked years that we live, let them forsake their way. Now, I can be a little hot-headed, and I get so mad at that stuff, and, and my cousin that does all this to me, I really think she's just trying to push buttons to see when I will go, go off. One day, she told me I was just like Jim, and I thought, well, you, you ain't seen nothing yet. Uh, and uh, so, I'm just, uh, I, I'm just saying, Forsake your way. 
You wicked people, the, 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 those that are not redeemed among us this morning, forsake your way and cry out to Christ, cry out to Him. Go to His way. And so we see if the, if the redeemed, you won't have to beg them to do this. The redeemed will come out of, will come out of the worldly lifestyle on their own. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will, for he will abundantly pardon. Now, you know, uh, part of the Catholic Church teaching is you can go too far. <laughs> you, you're outside of what can be done for you. Dear friend, that's a Catholic heresy, and there's no one, there's no one that exists is beyond the grace of God. The most wicked person you know, the Lord can call them, call them unto life. He, he can grant redemption. He can grant salvation. Uh, I mean, think about the thief on the cross. He was down to nothing. He, th there was no, think about Paul. He was going down to the church at Damascus to kill those people. At the very least, throw them all in prison. And listen, that, that wasn't a food stamp day. And, and if, if their mom and dad got thrown in prison, what was going to happen to the youngins? They'd go hungry. They, they, they would starve. That was his mindset. He was going down to Damascus to do that. And praise be the Lord. The Lord Jesus uh, intervened and saved his soul. And he was never the same again. Who, you know, when you begin to think of wicked characters, that's it. Uh, the writer of Amazing Grace, he knew what he was singing about. He, uh, one of the most wicked men you could find. And the Lord intervened. You see, th th that, that's the reality. No one is outside the Lord's grace. And, and, and so we find, as Isaiah is writing, he reminds them of the pardon that is found in Christ. Verse 8, this is the one we don't necessarily like, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Now, what we would like it to be is, you know, okay, let's see how many we can get baptized or let us see how many we can get to repeat the sinner's prayer and, and, and let's keep some numbers on this thing. But you know what? That's not God's way. You know what I have found? Dead people don't pray, right? And people dead spiritually don't pray either. He grants them life. And then they will cry out to him, I guarantee you that. And you say, well, that's not fair. <coughs> His way is not our way. You know what would be fair? Uh, the, the real meaning, what they're saying is that's not just. The, the real just thing we do would be throw every one of us alive into hell. That would be just because that's what we deserve. That's not popular preaching, is it? And so we then, so we find then that we <laughs> we, we got to remember when we're being missionary that <laughs> our thoughts are foolish. Verse nine: For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now I want you to notice notice two things. First of all, that he says. Heavens plural. And there are three heavens. Uh, the Bible says that I think John was caught up into the third heaven. And that's the abode of God. We can look up a uh, pretty day out there, kind of hazy sky. That's the first heaven. Beyond that is the atmospheric heaven where the stars and the planets abide. And yet beyond that is the abode of God. And there, and, and, and the he, uh, he says, my ways are, are there. My, my ways are above that. My ways are at the very top. You know, uh, man thinks a lot of himself sometimes, doesn't he? You know, I, and I don't mind theological preaching. It has its place. But we're not, we're, we're not here this morning to have a theological discussion. We're here to point others to Christ. 
that's preaching. What did Paul say? He says, I, I, I came unto you not knowing anything but Christ and him crucified. Remember that? that, that that's pretty easy stuff. Man. I point to you this morning. Jesus is your answer. I don't, know, uh, I don't know what your question is this morning, but I assure you that Jesus is your answer. That, that is what you need. And so he reminds us that uh, the what he does is way up here. And he says, my ways are higher than your ways. Now, that's a very true statement. Uh, our ways our methods uh, I remember when we were growing up mom was like oh that's just his ways y'all ever heard that from your parents or grandparents well what they were really saying that was his characteristics that that's how he presents well the way that God presents truth and what we think truth is is polar opposites uh, yeah, you ever wonder why the doctrines of election and predestination are so offensive? Because it's not their ways. It's not their thoughts. And that's offensive, and, that, and that, that's me. You know what? I never could understand this, and nobody could explain it to me, is, okay, you have a live baby inside the womb, and we kill that, and it's okay. But it's not right to say that uh, we're born into misery. We're born in the need of a savior. Doesn't that seem like polar opposite and, and a double standard to you? That that. But what we need this morning, what every one of the lost need, is salvation. It, it is the Lord Jesus Christ it is to be born again. Verse ten. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth out of my mouth. Now, notice this dear promise. He says, the word's going to come out. And it's going to do exactly what it's meant to do. When I was in Armenia, I get tore up when there'd be no response to my message. <laughs> you know what? That's, that's in the hands of the Almighty. I don't even have to stress about it. <laughs> if I've preached what the Lord has given me, I'm done. You know, uh, nursing can be a field very much that you take it home with you. You know, so if... Uh, I've never worked in a factory, but I, I'm guessing if you work in a factory, I don't know, Jared's taught me different than this. I'll have to recant. But I would think when you, try, uh, when you clock out a factory, man, you're done. you got to go back. But, you know, you, you don't say, oh, well, I wonder if I did that air conditioner right. But when you're a nurse, you think, did I give them the right medicine? Did, did, did I start that IV correct? Did, did you do this? Did you do that? And you know why? Because you're dealing with people. <laughs> you're, you're dealing with living people. Not train air conditioners, you know? But what about if you're dealing with a never dying soul? I see my responsibility as a registered nurse, but I see this one much, much greater. Because I'm de dealing with the living souls of man. And, and if I say, <laughs> If I'm not, if I'm not adherent to that book, what would the what would the end point be? You know what you need? You need a pastor that will tell you the truth. And you know what I have found? And it may be a little balking like a like a, a mean mule, but redeemed people love the truth. Now at first they're like, well, I don't know about that. But eventually they'll love the truth. I remember the first time Brother Downs uh, taught me about election. I thought he had gone crazy. But you know what I did? I read the Word of God. I remember that Wednesday night. Well, Brother Larry, what'd you think? 
What can I say? <laughs> and you know why? Because I'm one of his. I'm redeemed. And uh, despite it hurting right here sometime and getting knocked around, the redeemed love the truth. I, I found that to be true. And I, I don't stress out when people run off and leave because the, the reality is this. <laughs> The redeemed love the truth. And, and so when I'm preaching, the Lord's going to take care of the rest of it. If I'm faithful to the word of God, that's all I need to do. And, and the Lord will do whatever he, it seems good to him to do with it. It shall not return unto me void. Now, a lot of people immediately think, well... See, that shows you're going to get some souls for your labor. No. It may be one of these. And these are tragic, but they're real. Lord, I've never even heard of you. Yeah, you did. That country boy preacher in Stewart County, he told you the truth. And you wouldn't listen. That's not returning void. They made that man guilty, right? We, we want to see hoops and hollers and a building full of people, don't we? Don't get discouraged, dear friend. Just because you don't have it don't mean the word, the word is returning void. He's doing things higher than our ways. He's accomplishing things after the counsel of his own will. He's doing what seemeth good unto himself. He is the God of the Bible. And, and so we see then, as the Lord's people, that um, we have a sweet promise. The second part of that verse says, but it will accomplish which I please. It, it don't, you all remember when old Jonah was going to, he said, I want you to go down there to Nineveh and I want you to uh, lay out some messages for those people. And... Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. But you know what? Jonah did go to Nineveh. He went through the school of hard knocks and he arrived right on time. Said he ran, he, he, he was so tore up about it that he ran three days' journey in one day. <laughs> That'll get you moving, won't it? See, a good whipping from the Lord will put you in the right speed. And, and, and so he, that's exactly what happened. And he went and preached. And God gave a great revival, and men of it was saved, and Jonah got mad about it. Right? Didn't turn out like Jonah. You know what Jonah wanted men of the day to collapse, and just like when Achan and his crew uh, rebelled against Moses, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up, that's what he wanted for Nineveh. Nineveh. But you know what? God's ways are higher than our ways. Huh? He accomplished a great revival and he made God's man mad. <laughs> yeah, don't get down on Jonah. That's every one of us. Uh, we, 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 think, we think we know better than the Almighty does. And so we see rich promises that this is not going to return void. It's going to accomplish everything uh, it was meant to do. The last of that verse, and it shall prosper in the thing where to I sent it. That's where it's going to prosper. It's not going to prosper in what we think is right and what we think should ought to happen. It's not going to prosper in, in our big ideas. But it's going to prosper what he meant it to do. You know, sometimes I think about, and, and who knows, the Lord may uh, have a, a unbelievable, un ununderstanding plan for our church. But you know what? I'm not going to last forever. What's going to, you know, you know how you get in the flesh. What's going to happen when I die? Well, you know what? That's in the hand of God. Uh, I don't have to worry about that. I'll be at the feet of Jesus. Uh, don't take on burdens that don't belong to you. You, you ever felt like you've done that? And, and just one more, just carry it around and wallow in it. And all the time, remember God has it. His will is already being worked out, already being accomplished. And, and so we see then that uh, Isaiah gives them a reminder 
It's not about you. It's about the Almighty. Verse 12, for we shall go out with joy. You ever do that? Just go out of this place with joy, with happiness, with gladness. I don't see a lot of that among God's people anymore, do you? Go out with madness, maybe, but not, not gladness. Go, uh, leave this place, hear this message. Go be a testimony. Go, go be a missionary with joy, with gladness, with, 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 with uh, glory. Ye, for ye shall go out with joy and be led with peace. Now, uh, Jarrett touched on this uh, uh, in his Sunday school lesson about peace and what a rare commodity it is in the day which we live. If you have no reaction, does that mean you don't care? When we have peace, listen, it, it, it doesn't mean it's like water off a duck's back and someone tells you something and you have no response. But you don't fall apart either. You don't start screaming. You don't start worrying, oh, what's going to happen next? Love, joy, peace. The third fruit of the Spirit. And the theme of the Word of God came back and taught peace again and again and again and again. Now, and, and you ever wonder why that's the theme of so many messages? Because they didn't have it. They didn't have it. The, Lord, the, the devil will rob your peace as, as quick as you get it. You know what? The first thing he does, he likes to make you question your salvation. Just, as, just uh, I was 12 when the Lord saved me, and uh, he made me question it. Is it real? Do you have something that, that, that is uh, steadfast? And, and so as Isaiah is writing, he says, you get out of this place, you leave the temple, you get out there among your other, your other people with joy and peace. Those are two things that you should have as, as one of the Lord's people. And ye shall go out with joy and be led with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing. Now, what's in the mountains and the hills of the Jerusalem area? Remember the woman at the well? Where did she say the temple ought to be? She said, the, the Jews say in this city is where we worship, but my people says up in the mountains. What was this woman? She was a Samaritan, right? Half-breed Jew. And he says, you sing so they can hear it up there with those Gentile mixed people. You sing so people take a notice. You glorify the Lord so people hear and understand. You be a witness to people and think about the Jews and how they looked at the Samaritans. Remember what the old woman said as Jesus was sitting there on the well? How is it that thou speakest to me when thou art a Jew and I am a Samaritan? The Samaritans have no dealing with the Jews. Remember that? I believe what this verse is telling us, we need to have some dealings with people that we may not think is too good. That, that, that we that think that maybe we're a little bit better than they are. We need to have some dealings with it. You never know what your words are going to come back to you. Uh, uh, pastor up here at, uh, uh, or Mel, Melvin Dunway pastor for so many years uh, on Clarksville Road, Pleasant Grove. Yeah, Pleasant Grove. Uh, he started asking me, we worked together, and he started asking me some questions. And he kind of come to the doctrines of grace, but he said, he liked me, and he, he says it don't seem fair to me. And I just took him and I said, listen, you, you're messing up two words, fair and just. It was right, right here in this building, right there. And I said, if just, God would send every one of us to hell. And probably it's been 12, 14 years ago. 
And he told me one day, we was working on Jared's mother's house. And he said, thank you for being patient with me. See, there has been a whole lot. <laughs> if we get too probable, well, he's Southern Baptist. He don't know what he's doing anyway, right? No. Give that loud voice. Do it so they can hear it in the hills. Because, see, this is one thing about the election. We don't know who is. Amen. Right. And, and so we should share it with everybody. And so Isaiah gives them this truth. Sing it so that they can hear it up in the mountains. <laughs> the last of that verse, all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of, the, instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to the name to the Lord for a name, for an, ever, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Now, I want you to see the riches in verse 13 and we'll be done. He speaks of a time when the curse is gone. No briars, no thorns. Now, in that pasture up closest to my neighbor, that's where I'm putting my bees. <laughs> and uh, 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 there's two big old thorn trees. And I hate going around those things, and I'm like this, going under them. I asked Eric about it, and he told me he didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> and uh, Eric thought, when those thorn through the trees ain't going to be an issue. I know I can cut them down, but my question is, what am I going to do with them then? <laughs> I sure don't want to pull on them and stuff, right? Yeah. Can you imagine a time where that's not even an issue? Can you imagine a time where illness is not even a thing. Can you imagine a time, and I don't know how glory would be, and I don't, you know what, this I'll say with surety. People in Joey's situation, I have no idea about their eternal redemption or anything. I studied the Word of God. Is he accountable? I don't know. I mean, I'll I just be honest, I don't know, but just, if he is riding on grace, can you imagine sitting down and having a conversation with Joey Storms? <laughs> it's amazing, ain't it? That's the thorns and thistles. But one day they're all going to be gone. You can take a thorn tree and just give it a big hug if you're a tree hugger. And, not, and, and no issue whatsoever. Those of you that are lost, you look into, you look into the Lord while you may be found.